Hi, my name is Carlos Ruiz and I am a member of the INRF staff here at UC Irvine. And today I'd like to show you how to use Xenon Life Guard machine. Now, before we start going into the details on how to use this machine, I'd like to talk about the theory and how it works. So, xenon fluoride is a crystal that sublimates almost immediately in this setup to become gas. Now, xenon fluoride gas will react with silicon to make xenon gas and silicon difluoride. This is a form of dry etching, which means that you don't need to use a plasma and you don't have to worry about anything like that. It's just straight up gas reacting with silicon, which is usually solid in this case. Now, unlike Plasma, it's plasma based etching. This is not anisotropic, it's isotropic. So if you're not careful, this will give you undercuts and it might etch to your sample. So keep that in mind. Now the next thing I want to talk about is how fast it etches. Typically on a 10 by 10 millimeter squared sample of silicon, this will etch several microns a minute. Now this varies on your load. So if you have a bigger sample than that or smaller, it will be either slower or faster respectively. Also temperature is a consideration when making this, when setting up this machine. On a hot day, you might notice the chamber fills up quickly and your reaction will occur faster. This is because heat contributes energy to this reaction. Conversely, on a cold day, you would see the opposite. The chamber fills up slowly and your etch rate will slow down. So for this reason, I think it's important that you guys make note of all the environmental conditions in your procedure or your process so that when you come time to do it again, you can see if it's different and you can plan accordingly. So with all that theory out of the way, Let's look at our tool. So this is our Xenon Fluoride tool. I'd like to point out three things. We have a etching chamber here, we have our logging computer, and then we have our control panel here. Now, before we start using the tool, I want to remind you to always log in. Okay, so after we've finished logging in onto the computer, we want to make sure the tool is in good standby condition. So there are a couple of things I want to point out to make sure the tool is properly in standby mode. First, you want to see that this screen it says standby mode and it should see a green button on it. Next, you want to look at the, the whole machine as a whole and just make sure it looks safe. This thing should be screwed on, the chamber should be closed. And lastly, you want to look at this pressure transducer. Now typically it reads 40 millitors, but right now it's just 38. And this is a common thing you're going to see on this tool. See, the pressure transducer used for this tool is made of silicon and this tool etches silicon. So, when we have a measurement tool that is affected by the machine itself, we're going to have some drifting. And that's what you're seeing here. It's drifting away from its base value of 40. So, but it actually is 40 millitors, it's saying 38 because of the drifting and, and caused by the etching of our sensor. This is something we can fix by recalibrating ourselves. So don't worry about this. As long as it's close enough uh, and make a note of it in the logbook, we can come back and adjust it back to 40. So after we check all these things, we have to go back to the chases and check a few more things. So I'll see you there in a moment. Hello again. So we just came out of the Xeon I Fluoride room. Right next door is the chases room, room 2331. First, when you go in there, you're going to be surrounded by a lot of noise, a lot of machines, pumps, and all kinds of things. Some things to keep note of, that if you smell anything or if anything's dripping or leaking, you should stay out of the room and inform staff right away because these can be very dangerous gases or very dangerous leaks for your health and we want to make sure you stay healthy. So please let us know if there's any problems in there, if you notice anything weird or unusual and we'll come check it out for you. So let's go inside. Here we are in the chase room. Don't be put off by the loud noises. It's very loud in here but it's okay, it's safe to be in here. So the object of interest here is the pump for the Xenon Fluoride. This is our roughing pump. Right here you see an oil level, so we want to make sure the oil is within spec. You have a maximum and a minimum here, so make sure the oil is just between these two, preferably higher up next to the maximum. Next, we have a tube in here that comes from the pump to the chamber on the other side of the wall. This tube is very important. It must be dry and it must not be damaged in any way because xenon and fluoride gas will be pumped through here. If you see condensation, in other words, water droplets, that makes a bad sign. It may be a, a sign of a leak or something worse. Next, you want to make sure that this pump is active and turned on. So you should feel it vibrating. And you should feel some heat off of it. It's a pretty warm tool, so I wouldn't touch it too long. I'm just tapping it. But once you see it's on and vibrating, the oil level is good, and this tube here is defect-free, we are ready to start loading our samples and using the tool. I'll see you next door. Now that we've checked the chassis and made sure the chamber and everything in the machine looks good, 
we can start using our machine for our etching process. If you look over here, as I mentioned earlier, this is our control panel for our Xenon Fluoride machine. There's a couple of buttons, there's an overview of the chamber, and there's also a bunch of parameters that you can modify in your process control. So to begin, we want to hit the remove wafer button. While it's removing the wafer, it's actually doing a purge routine. Now a purge routine is just a routine where we have nitrogen gas flood the etching chamber, which is the one located below, and then the roughing pump pulls out all the gas. Based on our parameters, it's gonna run it five times for five seconds. So we have five cycles here and five seconds of purge duration. After it's done purging, this chamber will open up and allow you to load a sample. So after you've hit the remove wafer button and the purging is done, it will start venting out with nitrogen gas. To open this chamber, you wanna unscrew this fastener, put it down, and gently pull up, like so. Now, if you try to open this too soon, it might be stuck. That's fine, you just wanna give it more time to load up with more nitrogen gas. If after some three, five minutes or so, you still can't open this, you may use a small tool like a screwdriver to lightly pry it. And by lightly, I mean use the minimal force because it does get sticky sometimes. Now, once we have this chamber open, we put our sample in here, and then we close the chamber. And then we just fasten this again. And on the screen, we hit load wafer. Immediately you'll see this transducer in front jump up and then it should jump back down. So it's gonna start going down. It levels off around 28 millitor, but you don't have to wait that long. You can just wait until 50 millitor. Once we hit 50 or less, here we have less than 50, we can go ahead and start purging our sample chamber. So on the screen, you'll see this purge button here. So we hit it, and it'll begin purging. While it's purging, I'll explain how the system works. So as you see in this diagram, we have an etching chamber, a pulsing chamber, roughing pump, nitrogen gas source, and a Xenon fluoride chamber. Now, this system describes it this way, but it's not actually this way. It's more like this. We have an etching chamber where your sample is placed. It's, a, it's this big thing here in front, and this pulsing chamber doesn't really exist. It's actually using the Xenon fluoride bottle itself as an expansion chamber. So it's kind of a misnomer here. Also, we only have one pressure transducer, and it's, it's the one attached to the etching chamber. So you'll always see the pulsing chamber and the etching chamber reporting the same pressure because of the shared transducer that we have. And of course, it's the same transducer I mentioned earlier, the one that drifts. So it's all related like that. When, you, when you're purging, we are pushing nitrogen gas through the etching chamber, but it'll show you the pulsing chamber also filling up. Again, like I said, it's not really filling the pulsing chamber, it just looks like it is because of the way the transducer is set up. After it hits, it fills the etching chamber, we rough it out with the roughing pump. And this does this however many times you set it for, in this case five cycles, and it purges for five seconds. We recommend you keep the purge cycle like this and it doesn't change. Now, when we use the fluoride gas, it's gonna come out of this gas chamber directly out here and to the etching chamber. Now, this is important to know because when you're feeding it ZNI fluoride to, to this etching chamber, you're not using the pulsing chamber, so you're just doing a direct feed through. And this is gonna be important later when I explain how this will affect your etch rates. Now, before we start etching with this recipe, we want to do a small little check in the back and open the bottle. Now, before we start pulsing our xenon fluoride machine, we must open the precursor bottle located behind the tool right here. This bottle contains a solid crystal xenon fluoride, which sublimates into gas and is pumped into the chamber in pulsing. To open this bottle, you simply turn this nozzle here, all the way open. Now, a couple of important safety features that we added to this tool recently include this ventilation right here. This ventilation is pulling air from the inside of this entire tool. So if there's any leaking of xenon fluoride, this ventilation will suck it out before it gets into the room. Another important feature is the HF monitor located right at the entrance of the ventilation. So we can't show it on video, but the HF monitor is pulling air from the ventilation right as at the source and leads back over here. This is the monitor showing a reading of zero ppm. If there's any HF, 
you're gonna see some kind of reading. Now, unfortunately, this monitor is not auditory, it's just visual, so you have to take a look at it once in a while and make sure nothing's wrong. So right now, we're good, zero, and there's no trouble or any alarm happening right now. So you might ask, why we have an HF monitor for a ZNF fluoride tool? Well, if ZNF fluoride were to leak into the atmosphere, water can react to ZNF fluoride to make HF vapor. And HF vapor, as we know, is very dangerous to your health. So this monitor helps ensure our safety by making sure that if there is any ZNF fluoride leaking from this tool, and if it's becoming HF, we can detect it here. So if you see some kind of leaking, it doesn't mean you're in immediate danger, but it means something's wrong with the tool. And I would suggest turning off the precursor bottle and stop using the tool and contact some staff before proceeding. Once you've opened the ZNF fluoride bottle in the back, you're ready to press pulse etch. Now it will begin pulsing. As you can see here, the ZNF fluoride chamber with that bottle in the back is now opened and ZNF fluoride crystals are sublimating into gas, as you can see here. The chamber is filling up and it's going to hit our temperature of 2500 millitors. Now the ZNF fluoride chamber has reached 2500 millitors, the timer will start. As I mentioned before, this chamber doesn't have a true pulsing chamber, it just feeds directly through from the recrystal bottle to the etching chamber. The precursor bottle is also used as an expansion chamber. This results in slightly higher pressures as the ZNF fluoride keeps being fed from the bottle, as you can see in the transducer down here. It's reporting about 2.7 and it's rising, and it will continue to rise slowly as the etch process continues. So keep this in mind, because you'll get a little more etching than you expect based on your recipe. However, we still benchmark from this recipe that we have on the screen over here, which is 2500, 50, 80 seconds. You're free to modify the etch pressure and durations, but you should keep in mind that when you do more pulses without taking a break, the chamber will begin to fill up more slowly. This is because you are exhausting the amount of available gas in the precursor and are forced to wait for more ZNF crystals to sublime. As the bottle becomes more empty, this will become slower and slower as the concentration gradient becomes smaller. As this continues to happen, you'll see your process time increasing as the chamber takes more time to fill. The etching chamber is already etching while it's still filling, and the timer doesn't start until a specified pressure is met. So whenever you're, you're etching, I want to stress again that you might overetch a little bit, so bear this in mind. That's why I re we recommend this recipe, because this recipe seems to work pretty nicely with our process, and it shouldn't climb more than 3,000 millitors. So now our pulse etching routine is done. As you can see, the buttons are now solid again, and we're ready to continue our process. So before we do anything, we want to make sure that bottle behind the chamber is closed. I'm going to close it very briefly. Once, it, once the bottle is closed, you want to hit purge again. So we'll hit the purge button. And this will purge the chamber of any xenophoric gas that might be left over our reaction. When your sample is done venting, go ahead and unfasten this again and open the chamber and take your sample out. Now what I would suggest is taking your sample to a microscope and just visually seeing if it's done. If it's not done yet, you can put it back in and reload the sample like before. But if you are done, what you want to do is just simply load it with no sample inside, fasten it again, and you want to hit load wafer on the screen. So it'll pump down like, like before, it'll load the wafer, and you want to wait till this reaches 50 millitor again. But while we're waiting for this, if you're done, you want to be sure to log everything you did in our logbook. So this is our general format. We have a date, we have name, the etch chamber base pressure is the pressure you saw before you did anything. You can ignore this parameter. And here's your recipe. So you want to record your recipe and make any notes. If you had any problems or anything like that, you want to put it here. If everything was okay, just write okay, and that's good for us to know. As you can see, our chamber has already dropped below 50, so we'll just hit purge again. I like to purge in case there's any moisture that got in the chamber, just to get it out, but technically you can just hit standby, but I like to practice purging. Once it's done purging, and everything has been cleaned up, the bottle is closed, you fill the logbook and everything is done, you can hit standby. Now standby is a little different from purging and load wafer, in the sense that when you load a wafer, all you're doing is having the pump pump out the air. When you put standby, you're actually feeding a little bit of nitrogen gas through the chamber. Now this is important because 
when you just have a pump running and it starts to stabilize, you're going to get some oil backfill into the chamber and then you're going to get oil in the chamber. And that's bad because oil will affect your process, it might contaminate your sample and things like that. What standby helps do, helps do is it has a flow of air through the chamber and not back to the pump. So even though it's just a little bit of nitrogen gas, it's enough to prevent the backfill of oil. And you'll see the difference here. It's a little lower than expected and it should stabilize soon because we just started the process, but this should go back to about 40 millitors when it's stable. And that's how you can tell the difference between standby and load wafer. Load wafer will give you around 28 millitors, which is lower, and standby will give you around 40 millitors, which is a little higher because of that extra nitrogen that we give it into the chamber. And with that, that concludes how to use the tool. And I hope you have good luck with it and good process work with it.